Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Grönskog and I'll present our paper called Compositional Neural Scene Representations for Shading Inference. This was joint work with Fabrice Roussel, Marius Papas and Jan Novak. So in this presentation I'll be talking about new forms of representing virtual scenes. Traditionally, a scene is created by an artist by creating some meshes, placing lights, crafting materials and composing the shot with a camera. This scene is then given to a renderer, such as a ray tracer, to simulate light transport in the scene to ultimately output an image. Physically based rendering, however, is computationally expensive. To combat the high cost, prior works have proposed to render inexpensive images of the scene, a G-buffer, using a traditional renderer and then translating these to higher quality images using neural networks. A notable paper here is Deep Shading by Nalba and colleagues. Unfortunately, these models cannot synthesize lighting effects caused by objects outside the camera view. So to overcome this problem, we utilize a neural scene representation, which is input into the neural, neural renderer to fill in information missing from the G-buffer. The G-buffer and the neural scene representation then complement each other. In fact, we believe a complementary design where a traditional renderer coexists alongside a neural one is the most promising approach for the near future. Having the traditional renderer output direct lighting only and synthesizing only the expensive indirect illumination using the neural renderer could actually be quite practical and I'll show a few results towards the end of the talk. So this is a quick overview of how our rendering system works. We'll now focus on the neural scene representation, how to extract it, what it represents and how we can make it compositional. So the first question is, given a 3D scene, how do we encode it into a neural scene representation and what format should that representation be? There have been plenty of previous approaches to scene representations. For example, voxel-based representations have been used in work such as transformable bottleneck networks. Such representations fall under rep explicit representations these are easy to manipulate, but can consume a lot of memory or be non-trivial to use in network models, such as in the case of meshes. Then there are other approaches where we have an implicit representation, such as in scene representation networks by Sitzman and colleagues. Implicit representations are more difficult for a user to control, but can actually be quite memory efficient. We follow the implicit uh, approach based on the work of Islami and colleagues. Their method receives image observations of the scene and then codes these into a neural scene representation that is then used to render novel views. And as you can see from this animation here, and the results are quite impressive even with just a single observation. So let's take a closer look at their architecture. As mentioned before, they have a set of image observations of the scene with their corresponding camera coordinates, and these are all rendered beforehand. A convolutional encoder network then processes these observations independently to produce a set of representations, shown in pink here. Then by computing the average, view invariance is enforced, and ultimately we end up with a single vector of floats representing the whole scene. And this is then given to the neural renderer together with a query camera pose to produce an image from this novel view. One ma major problem with their approach, however, is that the representation is a black box that is difficult to analyze and to control. Another notable disadvantage is that the training time is extremely high, with networks taking even weeks to train just to produce these 64 by 64 images. However, their encoder network is actually extremely lightweight in comparison to the rendering network. So, in our case, we assume that the 3D scene can be rendered using traditional renderers. So we can therefore make the job of the encoder and the neural renderer a bit easier by providing them with additional image buffers rendered using the traditional renderer. And this significantly speeds up training and allows us to replace the fairly involved generator network of Islami and colleagues with just a simple fully connected model. But the focus of our work is not so much on the actual architecture, but on the neural scene representation. So we want to analyze what information it carries, 
how to disentangle independent components of the scene, such as lighting and materials, to, make, uh, to ultimately make the representation compositional. So in order to analyze the flow of scene information easily, it is desirable to minimize the overlap between the G-buffer and the neural representation. So there, hence we make the design, design decision to put only geometric information into the G-buffer, specifically world space position, normal and object IDs. Then lighting information and surface materials are captured only by the representation, which complements the G-buffer. But it may also contain some geometry of objects that are outside the camera view. And with this split, we can quite easily identify artifacts caused by the networks. This is what we used in most of our experiments. Here are some images from one of our datasets. It's in these simple indoor scenes with some randomized furniture and materials. So for example, if we train the generation network on the previous dataset only with the G-buffer as input and no neural scene representation, this is the type of result that we get. It learns to produce this average lighting and materials of the training set. And if we include the representation, we get the correct materials and lighting. But so far, I've been mostly talking about the setup. But now we will focus on improving the interpretability of the neural representation and on making it compositional. So the representation used by Islami and colleagues is just a monolithic block of floating point numbers that has no inherent structure. We propose to partition the representation into lighting, geometry and material components based on an approach by Kulkarni and colleagues. However, with this static partitioning, we have to decide the partition sizes in advance before training. In many scenes, this might not be optimal. So we most likely have some scene aspects that need more variables allocated than others, but it's quite difficult to predict what is optimal for a neural network. So to solve this problem, we replace the hard non-differentiable bound partition boundaries with soft boundaries. And thanks to this softness, the boundaries are now differentiable and allow us to learn the partitioning of the representation. Then over the training duration, we sharpen the boundaries such that they converge to hard edges. Now with this approach, datasets that require more material information will result in networks with larger material partitions. And similarly, if more lighting information is required, we'll end up with a larger lighting partition. Such flexibility is desired, especially in our setup, where the neural scene representation complements the geometry information in the G-buffer. So using this approach, we can also study how different networks prioritize different types of information based on their loss function. So on the right, we plot how the partition sizes change during training. The yellow curve here represents the size of the lighting partition, the blue curve for geometry, and then we have the red curve for materials. Then for additional visual support, we show some generated outputs on the, on the left. So due to its high impact on our loss function, the model initially prioritizes lighting information and thus the lighting partition grows. Once the lighting is roughly matched, the model focuses on extracting and utilizing material information. And lastly, we see a steady increase in the geometry partition, as this information is vital for correctly synthesizing shadows. The compositionality of our representations permits high-level editing tasks, such as relighting. This can be done by taking the lighting partition of one representation and simply placing it into another. So here's an example of that. We have two different scenes from the same dataset. So if we take the lighting from the second scene, we can see that the indirect lighting changes compared to the image on the left. And similarly, the specular highlights have also moved based on the new light position. And this, what this does is it suggests that the network has learned that these effects are caused by a combination of material and lighting information and that it does not bake them into the materials. 
Using the same idea, we can generate new lighting configurations through interpolation. Say we have two scenes and we take the lighting partitions of each. We can then interpolate between these and place the result into a different scene. And here on the right you can see an animation of that. But so far we have introduced adaptively learned partitioning of the representation, but we still have to decide the total size of the representation in advance. So we propose to add a fourth partition that is empty. So we've, we just fill it with zeros. This means it won't impact the generator and can actually be removed after training. Now the only purpose of this partition is to act as a reservoir of available dimensions. The optimizer can grow or shrink the partition depending on the needs of the model. To encourage the growth of this partition, we introduce a loss term based on the sizes of the other partitions, multiplied by a hyperparameter beta. It's important to note, however, that this is a lossy compression. So we'll basically get different levels of compression depending on the value of beta. So let's say if we have this scene here with a close-up of this teapot. We can see that an uncompressed representation main maintains the color of the teapot. But if the beta value is too high, we lose its green color. But simply by decreasing beta, we can get the color back. So with this approach, we can basically allocate a much larger representation and trust that the representation is compressed accordingly based on our requirements. But up to now, we have only talked about partitioning, but how can we reassure ourselves that the network is actually working in the way we expect it to? Many previous works have studied object classification using attribution methods. These methods identify regions in input images that uh, impact the classification the most. Our goal is slightly different. We want to understand how our generative model uses the observations, the neural scene representation, and the g-buffer, and what is the actual flow of scene information. We first study the representation in isolation. Specifically, we want to know what information is extracted from the observations to form the representation. So to do this, we compute the gradients of the representation with respect to the pixels in the observations and multiply them by the inputs, which are the pixels in the observations. To visualize these products, we false color them using yellow hue for lighting, blue for geometry, and red for materials. The false color images are shown on the left here. And then we can see that pixels that contribute significantly to a specific partition appear bright. But we can take this attribution even further by studying the specific patches in the output image. Our goal here is to identify information that was relevant for the patch and also through which partitions this information was delivered. So let's take a closer look at this. Say we have this generated image again, and then we have the observations of the scene. So now we want to analyze how the network produces this specific patch that contains a reflection of the light fixture in the mirror. And since the gbuffer doesn't contain information about reflected objects, the neural render must rely on the scene representation to synthesize the reflection. First, let's compute the attributions for the patch with respect to the representation. We can see that we have high attribution values for the lighting partition and only some for geometry and materials. We can extend the attribution all the way to the observations. And this allows us to see, for instance, that lighting information in yellow is sourced primarily from pixels that show the fixture. Now let's look at a different patch in the same image using the same observations. This patch shows a shadow boundary. So to correctly synthesize the shadow, the model should use both lighting and geometry information. And this is confirmed by the attributions with respect to the representation. There is very little attribution for the material partition, which is actually quite understandable as all scenes in this dataset use the same material for the floor. So basically the floor material is therefore baked into the model and doesn't need to be extracted from the observations. 
Finally, let's look at the observations. Similar to the last patch, the lighting attributions are centered on the light source. This time, there is even more geometry information extracted from the pixels, showing the floor and the table, as these are needed to synthesize this specific shadow. If you want to find more information, the paper contains a few more examples, and it also shows it that different generator architectures source information differently. For instance, we found that a convolutional unit relies more aggressively on the G-buffer than pixel generators, and this can actually cause it to fail at synthesizing shadows in specific cases. So let's now look at some additional results. Here we show an animation where the neural renderer infers all elimination, both direct and indirect, just from the G-buffer entry observations of the scene. The results are temporarily stable, but certain visual effects such as shadows and reflections in the mirror are synthesized with lower quality. But it's really important to note that both of these effects would require that the model is able to compute accurate ray intersections with the scene, and these are therefore understandably quite difficult for the network to learn. Arguably, the more practical application would be the prediction of difficult effects such as indirect lighting, as mentioned in the beginning. Here we show the network prediction for indirect lighting. In addition to the G-buffer, we also rendered direct illumination and material properties and fed those into the image generating network. And we can, for example, see that the network is capable of correctly synthesizing this yellow indirect lighting reflecting off of the table. And here's one more example. We can see that practically the only inaccuracy is the blurry reflection, but otherwise the results look quite believable. So now we have seen some results, let's discuss future work. One obvious improvement that should probably be made is changing the format of the observations. We inherited the encoder network from Islami and colleagues but a voxel green input might actually be better, like done by Ramatas and colleagues. This is because uh, these voxel representations contain information about the whole scene, which is generally not captured by, fully by a few random observations. We partition the representation into material lighting and geometry information. But Ideally, the properties of individual scene objects would be separated and easily controllable. And this could potentially also improve, gener improve the generalization of the method, because the network now has to learn to piece these things together. For example, a recent paper called Blockgun achieves this by aggregating object representations into a larger voxel representation. Finally, we only studied simple scenes, but our networks already struggled with sharp details, such as shadows. Here one idea could be to adopt positional encoding schemes, or testing different activation functions like the ones suggested in the Siren paper by Sitzman and colleagues. And this could potentially lead to higher frequency detail being captured better, as you can see from this image here on the right. We hope that this work inspires you to investigate this area further. We believe that there is truly an enormous potential in using neural scene representations and neural renderers in a complementary manner to traditional approaches. For example, this could be used with denoisers or for importance sampling or any other networks used, in, used with computer graphics methods. So that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for watching.